Hello, and welcome to the From the Shadows podcast. I am the producer, Jason Lewis. I would like to thank you for tuning in to the From the Shadows podcast. And without further ado, here is your host, Shane Grove. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the From the Shadows podcast. I'm your host, Shane Grove, and tonight I am joined with uh, the judge. Good evening. Uh, the super producer, Jason. How's it going, everybody? Hey, and our very special guest tonight, and we're going to say he's our uh, very first official UFO expert, William Haddix with the Central Ohio UFO Reporting Center. So, William, welcome Thanks. tonight. Thanks for having me on. Hey, we're, we're, we've been excited to... Uh, We've been excited uh, since we uh, learned we had a chance to have you on here because uh, I heard you on a um, Ohio Mysteries podcast and I was blown away by uh, you know just just all your knowledge and your presentation and uh, some of the stories you told and uh, once I told these guys about them we, we couldn't wait to have you on so um, thanks for joining us tonight I mean. Even though this is a couple days late, we were uh, delayed by weather the other day. So, uh, so hopefully, uh, hopefully the weather cooperates tonight. Oh, absolutely! We appreciate you coming on, William. Hey, my pleasure. So, uh, so William, um, l- let's just jump right into it. You, I want to hear the story that you told on the other podcast. Um, how did you get interested in the UFO phenomena? Okay, well, there's actually a couple parts to this, and I'll start off with how I got into just, like you said, the UFO phenomenon in general, and then I'll lead into why I started my own uh, reporting center versus joining up with somebody else. All right, sounds good. I got into this uh kind of field of study and just a general interest when i was a little kid my grandfather who had recently passed away back in july uh spent 19 years in the national guard and a few years doing some uh, laboratory work down in cincinnati ohio for the government but when he was in the military the biggest part of his uh career uh was during the korean war era uh, there's a base just north of me now. It's uh, Rickenbacker uh, Air Force, an Army base. They've got uh, some uh, air refueling planes up there, some helicopter squadrons. But at that time, it was Strategic Air Command, and it was called Lockburn Air Base. The name, like I said, had changed. And he was very familiar with the base, probably more than most, because one of his main jobs there during this time was he drove the staff car around. He was a chauffeur, basically, for all your higher-ups, your generals and commanders and whatnot. So he drove everybody around. So he was there quite frequently. I even took my dad there when dad was a kid and things. Well, after his time was done with that and he went to work with this laboratory, since he was so familiar with the base, he was the one delegated to run back and forth almost on a daily basis and take lab reports and whatever documents and things that needed to be, you know, moved around. So one particular morning, this was early sixties. I don't have an exact date, but he was there and said that he had actually saw a UFO round typical, you know, 1950s era, like you'd see in the movies flying discs land on the runway he said that uh, a group of uh looked military to him but he wasn't able to identify any of their insignias or anything he said swarmed that uh, craft so fast that he wasn't able to see it for very long uh they took it where he has no idea because he was not super close to it when it landed but close enough to definitely see it And he said one thing that was extremely odd to him, because aircraft in general were always flying in and out. I mean, it was a strategic air command at the time, so they was always preparing for 
you know, World War Three type of stuff. And he said before the disc landed, there was a call that came out over the PA system that said, if you live on the base, go inside the barracks and do not look outside. If you don't live on the base, go home. Telling everybody to leave. And he said that was very odd to him. And it wasn't just a few minutes later is when that uh, object ended up landing right on the runway. So that See, he just so the, but, did he describe how it landed? Did it land like a jet coming in? You know how it lands and rolls, or did it come and like come straight down like a helicopter? Straight down like a helicopter, just like you, uh, you know, have it in your hand, pick it up, and just lower your hand down. The best way I could describe it, I guess, was like those. Uh, Claw machines you see, you know, out in front of Walmart picking up stuffed animals. <laughs> yes. Yeah, of course. And it comes straight down, but almost in a, like a slow motion type of a thing. You know, they don't fall really fast. It was kind of really slow. And he had told me that story many, many times over the years and never was able to, you know, give any details as far as insignias or markings on it. But he said that all the insignias... He couldn't always remember what they were, but he knew that he didn't recognize them on these uh, people that were headed to the object and the ones that ended up doing whatever they did with it. He said he doesn't remember, like I said, what they were, but he just knows that he didn't recognize it. Now, so did he it, say... Oh, go ahead. I'm that, uh, was it his theory that this was a spaceship from another world, or was this a secret machine that the government had been working on and the individual flying it was American Airmen. Did he, did he ever relate that to you? Uh, the only thing that he ever alluded to was he always felt that it was not ours. Now, what could it have been somebody else's? Possibly. But he had been up there, and I had heard this from my dad as well, that Grandpa had been up there more than once when they were actually doing testing for different uh, aircraft and things and it was always a lot more uh i guess set up would go involved so they would know every person that's around they would have a lot more almost scripted you know everybody had their place what they had to do during actual military tests of different things and this time it didn't appear like any of that was the case because he was there and had no prior knowledge it was like a it was like a surprise landing the, is that what you're saying? Like that's it, it, that's kind of what it sounds like to the majority of people. Now there may have been certain individuals that may have had an idea, but it was something that I don't know. Maybe they had to keep it this way in order to keep more from leaking out. Because even when they done military testing and stuff, you know, uh, even Dad had said, you know. People knew about it ahead of time. They might not have known what was being tested or anything, but they knew something was going on. Now, now how close is Rickenbacker to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base? Uh, Columbus. Well, I, I mean, how real? I mean, really, how close is it? Rather than just Columbus State. It's the, it's in the same flight path. It's in the same same flight. Path. I'm about. Uh, I'm about. 30 miles from uh, the base, from Rickenbacker myself, and I know I'm also about 70 miles from Dayton. So I'm yes. just I'm just south of Columbus. Okay. And I, I see mean, all the right patterns and stuff fly over around here, you know, all the time. I mean, because of course the the ages old rumor is is that Wright Patterson was the um basically the resting you know the, the place right. where where the uh, recovered uh, aircraft from Roswell and wherever else there were uh, crashed UFOs over the years that that was where they ended up and I mean it just immediately jumps out to me is was this one of those crafts that they recovered they were testing and it just happened to have to make an emergency landing at Rickenbacker um, and it wasn't planned, obviously. That yeah. is that is definitely a possibility, and the reason I, I even say that is, and I've got this on my website, uh, Central Ohio UFO Reporting Center dot US. 
uh, up in the upper left hand corner. I actually found it on YouTube, but I was able to verify it through some other sources. The actual uh, radio broadcast from ABC News from the Roswell crash, when they admit right on you know, on the radio that they've got a flying disc and it's headed to Wright Patterson for further investigation. Oh, that, really? came out, that came out from <laughs> ABC News. And when they retracted that particular story with the weather balloon deal, that was actually from my town. Circleville, Ohio is where they got the weather balloon story. And that's been documented as well. That's fascinating. There were it's in a few different uh, books I've looked at over the years, and there were several farmers that had found some weather balloons, and they knew exactly what they were, but they called the sheriff to say, "Hey, you know, whoever sent these things up, they might want them back." So they turned them in, and since there was, I think five or six, and there was others in other areas that were found shortly after, and since so many were found, it just seemed like a plausible excuse. So, so at that time in Circleville and surround and surrounding areas, they farmers found weather balloons. Correct. The the army knew it, and said, "Hey, well, if these these people in Circleville and other rural parts of Ohio found these, well, maybe we can pass that story off." Exactly. As, okay. <laughs> and, and what uh, really struck my interest is, you know, and I'm not trying to downplay farmers or anybody like that but you know if an average farmer or whatever sees something like that and knows exactly what it is right away you would think high level military should have known it right away as well if that was actually the case well let hey let's just be honest ohio farmers are probably smarter than farmers in the rest of the country i mean come on right when we all when we all agree on that, yeah. I mean, come on. With the weather they got to put up with, yeah. Hey, uh, hey, William, uh, I wanted to ask you: Did your grandfather ever say anything about the size of this uh, craft? No, he didn't. He never mentioned anything. And uh, another interesting twist to this story as well: uh, This happened, oh, I don't know, five six years ago. I got interested in his military career because uh, there was virtually nothing known about what he'd done in the service. Very little. So I had called several agencies, had all of his information, and I've got his unit photos and some other things, and I got the same story every time that it didn't exist. He wasn't there. I was making it up. And I knew that wasn't true because I had some documents and they said, well, there was a fire out west and a lot of records were damaged, which was true. But I found out that it was records that were before his, alphabetical wise, that were destroyed. His would have been fine. And they completely denied every bit of it. And then once he passed away, like I said, back in July, we were going through some of his uh, things that he had out in the garage and whatnot. And I found a large rubber made uh one of them totes had a lid on it and i was going through it and of course he had saved everything from you know way back just people do that paperwork whatnot well at the very bottom of that tote was uh two or three years of his discharge papers that actually proved he was there even after the government people told me he never existed and all the papers i found predated this event though nothing after Wow. So were you tr so were you trying to find out like what his job in the military was or what he did at Wright Patterson or Rickenbacker? Anything. Um, now, did he not tell you exactly what he did, or you were just trying uh, to verify what he was saying? Well, I was just trying to just find something. I mean, of course, I believed him completely, but I was just trying to find some documentation on anything. You know, just something. Yeah. He was there or other places he might have been or, you know, what else did he do that I wasn't aware of? And they just said he wasn't even in the military. Right. They just said it, it didn't exist. They said, I'm sorry, yeah. but it does not. And I even gave his unit numbers and things. And they're just like, well, we're sorry, but there never was a unit, you know, like that. And there's other people that's lived here in town. They're passed away now. But they served with him. So I, I knew that it was he was there did they just tell you it was a weather balloon and that was that was it they said hey he did 
Your grandpa didn't exist. He was a weather balloon. Well, it seemed very <laughs> odd to me, though, that he told me he was never officially discharged. They told him on a Friday evening, you're done. Go home. No really? parents. No, no nothing. My grandmother, uh, which I never got to meet, she passed away when Dad was only 13, his mom. And uh, she had uh, cancer and everything going through that. And they, oh, he always told the same story. When the military found out that his wife was uh, dying with cancer, they said, go take care of your family. We don't need your services anymore. And that was it. And that don't happen. You know, nobody gets out of the military that easy. No, they don't. So that always struck me as odd. And that was part of the reason I tried to dig in to try to find some of his official discharges. But I'm not real familiar with the whole discharge process back at that time. But from going through the documents that I had found, he had a discharge and reenlistment of paper every year. It was once a year. So that, that's kind of odd as well. I thought, you know, you would have at least two to four year term and all of that. But it was one year and then out right back in. And I've got probably two or three, maybe four of those documents. I have to look. Is there, a, I mean, is there a, do you think there's a reason behind this or you're just stumped all the way around on that, on just, that aspect? Just pretty well stumped. I, I don't know. I've often wondered, though, if somebody up there may have recognized him or something and maybe jotted the information down and maybe they did do something. I mean, I really don't know. It just seemed very strange that, you know, you're seeing this kind of a craft and then now I'm finding out that, you know, you didn't exist. They're saying you didn't exist. It was an odd thing. And he never got any VA benefits or no kind of nothing. He really, was never eligible for anything. Maybe well, because your uh, maybe because your grandfather was not really military. He was uh, what they call other government agency, right? But he did. So be, he would correct. technically be United States military because he'd be correct government agency. But he did spend 19 years in the National Guard, though, that they say don't exist either. <clears throat> so. Yeah, but he never got any kind of government benefits from his military career. Not a, not a thing. Wow. So, so then this story then he, that he told you that you you know heard about you know probably many times as a kid. And it, so that then what propelled you into wanting to investigate UFO activity, or was there something else? But this is. That story is what initially got me interested in the subject, you know, kind of in general. And I had done little research things here and there over the years, looked up, read on different cases, and just like Roswell and some of the others. But I had got involved with some uh, a local group uh, many years back, and even some other groups uh, that done investigations and things, but. They were all those different groups for the reason I decided to branch out onto my own. Because every group I'd ever been with had a rule that I did not like. And I didn't even want to follow it. Which was, if I figure out what you saw, even if it was 747 Jumbo Jet, I was not allowed to tell you. I was never allowed to tell a witness what they actually saw. And I hated that rule. I, you know, I felt if you were willing to take the time to report whatever you saw and go through our whole process, then it, it should be up to me to give you the best answer possible. But I hated to leave people with no answer. So, so in other words, they didn't want you to tell them that it was nothing or they just or what? I mean, that's it didn't matter, it didn't matter what the answer was. You were never allowed to give the witness any answer. None. <laughs> Did they give you a reason for that? Yeah. All groups have this, had the exact same reason. Was if I tell you that you just saw, you know, a FedEx jet flyover or whatever, then you're going to get mad and retaliate at us because 
it wasn't an alien. Right. No, I see that. It, and you yeah. think about it, people who, you know, people who who listen to our podcast, I would say, are probably more likely than not people who are believers in paranormal things, cryptid things, things that go bump in the night. And you, I guess you don't want to scare off your audience. By saying, well, you know, there's a plausible explanation that, uh, you know, you really didn't see a UFO. What you really saw was a, you know, I think probably some groups are worried you're going to chase off, uh, but, chase off listeners. But there's a thing to that, though. Of everybody I've ever investigated over the years, over 95% of them have zero belief in aliens or in extraterrestrials whatsoever. They do not believe at all. Very few people I've ever talked to have actually had a belief in it. Most do not. They just know that an investigator probably, and I've been told this more than once, that you're a UFO investigator, so you're going to try to do everything in the world to try to figure out if it is an alien, because I'm sure you'd like to find one. Well, that's legit. So they figure that I'm going to give it more scrutiny than anybody else that they would talk to to try to figure out what they saw. But they said they, they have no belief at all. Alien thing doesn't exist, whatever. They just know that since I look at the sky and I'm familiar with how to look at, you know, figure out what objects were in the air at certain times, use flight radars and other things, that I could probably give them the best answer. And that's what... Let me, let me ask you this, Wim. The, you know, going back to the Roswell situation, you know, it's, you know, after the fact, the government did everything in its power to discredit the fact that this was a, you know, UFO. And, well, it's a weather balloon. They came up with everything. But, but recently, you know, even on Fox News and some of these other, you know, mainstream media outlets, um, you know, the government doesn't seem to be fighting as hard to disprove that UFOs really exist, that there could be life. And, and you know, we uh, we at the podcast had a roundtable one time with it. Uh, we, we talked about this and, uh, you know, kind of wanted your opinion on this. Do you think that, you know, the government's known, obviously, for years and they can't keep uh, the, the, the lid on the secret for that long? So they're kind of bleeding to the public that, yeah, these things are real so that it's not one of these, you know, you wake up one morning, the headline is aliens are real. They've been here. Oh, by the way, they've infiltrated the government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're just kind of weaning us on it. Uh, I've got a few mixed opinions on that one. They've definitely known something for a number of years, but now there are they are coming out with more, but that is due in part to a lot of uh, independent researchers. I would say there's uh, Tom DeLong from the band uh, Blink 182. He's the one. Oh kind of, yeah, he's yep. spearheading a lot of this. So yeah. the only reason, in my opinion, the government's talking about it at all is it's like giving a treat to your dog or something. You know, you give them just enough to satisfy people because they know that 99.9 percent of the public will never look into it any farther than what they're told from fox or whatever news agency they see that and they leave it leave it at that so excluding the national Enquirer, of course well, of course <laughs> because the i've read a few different uh statements from the air force and military in general that said you know no matter what they find out with this it'll be higher level classification than even the Manhattan Project was during World War II, you know, where they built the bomb. They said, this right. is higher level than that. And my thought was, which is a lot different than most, people always worry about mass panic or any of that. I don't think the government really cares too much about any of that. It's, especially the U.S. government, because most major governments around the world, China, uh, Russia, even Europe, some of the European governments, they've all at one time or another said they were going to release their UFO files. But our government has stepped in every single time 
and put some kind of a, a threat or something out there to keep them quiet. Well, and the, we kind of, you know, we talked about this, you know, one day and said, well, you know, mass hysteria. I mean, I don't know how the public would really react if tomorrow, you know, the government, you know, the president comes on and, and says, ladies and gentlemen, we're having a special newscast. Everybody needs to listen. Oh, by the way, you know, there's aliens have been here. Um, they've, you know, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. I don't know how people would react. I don't think I, the government's even too concerned with it. The thing they're concerned with is, especially the U.S. government, if they admit there's aliens out there, then that means we're no longer a superpower. We're no longer the top top dog in the world anymore. There's something out there bigger than us. We're helpless now. The U.S. government never wants to be put in a position to where they're not on top of everything, you know, worldwide kind of in charge, like we've pretty well always been. That's very they would, true. They would be giving up that whole thing and sitting back, sitting. With their thumbs, saying, and, and then nobody will ever listen to them ever again. Well, wouldn't that have a direct effect on the stock market and things like that? I, I would think that that would. Oh, I mean, would. Sure, it would have I mean, a lot of impact uh, globally on pretty much everything, but, you know, with anything else that were to pop up that could be a global type of a pandemic or anything, you know, our government's always been able to step in and uh, kind of do something about it, calm the water, so to speak. But yeah. if they're admitting that there's nothing they can do, it's, you know, they're looking at it like it's game over for them. Well, I mean, the thing about it is, I mean, you either... If you let's just assume, for sake of argument, that a that a, a, a an alien race from another galaxy has mastered some sort of propulsion system that will allow interstellar travel, okay. If you start with that premise, then then we automatically know technologically they're far superior than us. And if they have a far superior propulsion system, then they probably have super more advanced weapon systems. So we would be one of two issues, either one, they would be here to colonize, take over, take resources, which we would be in a lot of trouble or two, because they're so much more advanced than us, they, because they, they're a civilization uh, that has been around for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And they've advanced to the point where, War is not something that interests them, um, and they're here more for a scientific purpose. Um, then I think it, it creates two different, you know, two different situations. Um, but if they were here from a military standpoint, my gosh, it's been. I mean, you go back to Roswell's been however many years ago. So, what are they doing? Yeah, but fifty. <clears throat> 50, 60 years to them may just be a half a second. You know, mm -hmm. if, you can if you could travel across the uh, universe, um, no matter how fast you are, probably doesn't happen in a snap of a finger. So. You think about, well, you think about how long it takes. Uh, you start talking about speed of light. You know, Einstein proved nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Okay. And the nearest galaxy is how many millions of light years away. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, and this is going to get somewhat scientifically complicated, but if you can't, if you can't travel at the speed of light, which you can't, then the only other way you could travel that distance and not take millions of years is if you somehow had some sort of, uh, antimatter gravity drive which could bend space time where you could go from point a to point b instantaneously because you were able to fold space time right like got like a wormhole like yeah yeah if you got something like that then we're in a lot of trouble if, if they decide so, to be right so 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 william let's um let's get back then to you're, you know, how did you get into investigating UFO 
report and I mean, how long have you been doing it? Um, be you know, on your own. On my own, it's been about four years now. Uh, it, it took a little while to kind of get things off the ground because it's very hard to advertise to let people know that you're out there. That's been one of my biggest hurdles. And it, I mean, it's not so much, you know, a money issue, but just where do you advertise? You know, so it's been a little tricky getting the name out there. I uh, ran a few ads on Facebook, which got quite a bit of traction. So that helped, and then uh, through Google and whatnot, but and mostly word of mouth. But yeah, yeah once I started doing it that way, and people were really satisfied because I've got no, you know, credentials or no diploma hanging on a wall saying I'm qualified in any of this stuff. So what I like to do is, even if I can solve something, sometimes it's five or ten minutes, and you already know what it is, you can prove it, whatever. But I'll still spend a couple of days and put together a video or a slideshow presentation or something to give to the witness to prove to them that this is the answer. Not just me saying it, but I want to prove it. So that's always something that I've been really, you know, good with. I don't want anybody to take my word for it. I want to give them the same proof that led me to the conclusion. And I want to prove it all to them. So, so you're just you're thorough. You're you're dotting all the I's, crossing all the T's, yeah. using using everything that's available to you um, through what the weather service, air traffic control, government agencies to to kind of back up your conclusions. Things have changed uh, recently. Well, within the past six months or so, uh, I had worked a couple different cases. Uh, one was uh, Ohio, Ross County, and one was actually out of Louisiana. Uh, strange lights and uh, craft in the sky and whatnot. And before that, I had always had an excellent relationship with military. I mean, they'd call me back, always help me out, try to figure out things. But in these two uh, previous, most recent cases, they came flat out and said, we're not helping you a bit. You know? Hmm. So the the one out of uh, Ohio, I I can't confirm it, but with the evidence and everything I had to go on, I believe that I had stumbled on an experimental military aircraft. Really? Uh, because uh, that same week that it was spotted, that the two guys saw it. Well, let me back up. When it was initially spotted, uh, they saw it fairly close. It flew right overhead. It was at night flares coming out the back of it well a number of people saw it at a greater distance away and they reported it to the highway patrol which was in uh, Vinton county ohio and they had over 80 uh, patrolmen and other agencies out investigating this thing they thought it was a plane crash because they saw the flares and everything oh yeah okay but that same week wright patterson had put out a statement saying to basically to anybody if you can build us a fighter jet but we want one that's uh, completely ai controlled not even a drone so no pilot upload the program turn it loose but it has to be able to do air to air combat and air to ground so and they gave their dimensions and the kind of specs that they wanted and they hope to have something to test by summer of 2020 well, doing a little bit of looking around, I actually found a video on YouTube, of all places, from the military, Air Force, where they have already got one of these aircraft. They've already test flown it out west, and the dimensions and everything and movements were the same as the guy from Southern Ohio spotted. So I think they tested one ahead of time, because any time military does any training, which they do quite often around here, it's always multiple aircraft. They never just send up one. And in this case, it's one aircraft, no noise or anything. So everything met the criteria of what they wanted. And the video is actually on my website as well that you can see of the experimental test. So I, when I get cases like that that I can't 100% confirm, I'll usually uh, put my answer up there and put closed pending further information. 
So if I get more information on it somewhere, then I'll reopen the case and go at it again. But when I was working that particular case, I wanted to find out what other aircraft were in the area because this, the website that I use uh, for flight radar, I didn't have a subscription on at the time, so I couldn't go far enough back to find out. So I called the... Uh, I called all over. I even called the Pentagon, called NORAD, and both of those places told me something that I, of course, didn't agree with, didn't believe, that they don't have the capability to track aircraft. Oh, my goodness. Oh, <laughs> Did I hear you say you can actually pick up the phone and call NORAD? Sure. I didn't even know that was possible. Yeah. Every place, no matter how... You know, called the, I've talked to the White House about this stuff everywhere. Everybody's got a public relations department, and that's always who you need to speak with because most of the military people, they're not trying to lie to you. They don't know what they're allowed to tell you because they don't deal with the public. That's something I learned early on. They're not, you know, it might just be some random airman standing to watch it whatever time you happen to call. Well, him or her is not going to lie to you. They don't have any reason to. They they don't just don't know what they're allowed to tell you. They don't get these kind of calls, you know, when they're getting their little debriefing for a watch that day. It's not, well, if you get a UFO call from somebody, you know, tell them this or that. They, they don't get that kind of information. But, yeah, you can call all those. I Like I said, talk to all branches through the Pentagon and work with a lot of local law enforcement. Now, local law enforcement, they really enjoy it. They called me numerous times because they don't have the, the time or the resources to investigate this stuff so they'll pass it on to me which is always been fun and i do have a couple uh local cases i could mention uh if you want well of sure of course of course yes one, uh, one actually involves uh, uh local law enforcement and this one was pretty interesting to uh investigate it was didn't take long but it was fun uh, a lady called me one evening, and it had happened two or three nights before. She was driving on uh, it was route uh, State Route 104. It was in Ross County, uh, right by the Ross County Airport, and said they saw a bright white object, pretty large, they said, uh, bigger than a car, land in a cornfield. They watched it land about, about 11.30 at night. No, very little noise, nothing and they were really like kind of freaked out of what this was. So I'd done as much investigating on my own as I could. And I really wasn't finding anything. So I called the sheriff's office, got a hold of dispatcher. And she had uh, let me know who the was on patrol that night and actually patched me through to his car because he was on patrol again when I had called. And come to find out, he was in the same area when this object landed. And he was curious himself. So he talked to his partner that was with him that night uh, that was able to pay more attention because, of course, he wasn't driving. And come to find out what it was, it was a life flight helicopter that was doing an emergency landing. They couldn't land at the airport because being a small airport, there's nobody there at night. And they didn't know what might be on the runway or, you know, who knows what they could have left out. They landed in the field and it ended up being an emergency heart uh, transplant for the hospital there. They had already had a helicopter at the hospital landed, I guess, with the patient. So they weren't able to land there. So that's what landed in the field so they could transplant, uh, get that heart rush to the hospital. I thought that was a pretty interesting case. That is an interesting I, case. But that, that just, I, I mean, I don't, I haven't seen a helicopter land at night uh probably maybe once in my entire life, but I, I, how on earth can you not take a couple seconds and see what you're looking at? You know, just take a good look at what you're seeing. Cause it, the helicopter couldn't have landed 500 yards back in the field. You know what I'm saying? I don't uh, like something like that. I just don't understand why people couldn't take a little more time to really look at what they're, uh, see in and and soak it in a little more and make a better uh, assessment of what it is. Well, when you're, I guess when you're just 
heading home late at night doing 55, 60 mile an hour or whatever, people just generally just take a glance at something and just keep on going. Very few actually ever stop to, you know, find out any more. They didn't really, they were curious, but the curiosity, I don't even think sat in, you know, initially. Hmm. It wasn't till kind of an afterthought kind of a thing. But you hear, you know, you get all kinds of stuff when you do this kind of you know, job, I guess you could call it at times. And you never know what the next case will bring. One of the tricks I kind of had to learn early on, and I've got pretty good at it, is on some of these uh, cases, it's such an obvious thing that you've got to put out clues for the witness to let them almost figure it out on their own. Otherwise, you can make somebody feel pretty dumb. And I never <laughs> want to do that. <laughs> I always try to make them, you know, feel as good as, as possible. I never want to put anybody down or anything. Like the yeah. story that I had had that's been several months back, but woman calls and she had saw this uh, object in the sky same time at night for the same amount of time for several nights in a row so automatically I'm thinking planet or star it's just too predictable just... well she said it was making noise like it was on fire it was crackling so that was kind of interesting but she says that after I'd asked her some more questions she had only heard the noise after she watched the video she took of it not while she was standing there so my first thought was maybe she had a cheap cell phone case that was making some noise when she was moving her phone around and the microphone was picking it up. So I said, set your phone down, record the thing, and just walk around. See if you hear anything. Well, about three or four days went by and she gets back with me and she says, I found the noise. I said, well, what was it? Her neighbor was doing laundry and it was something clanging around in the dryer. And I picked it up. <laughs> So with cases like that, you got to be very careful on how you deal with the person, or you can really, you know, upset somebody or just, you know, really Clearly, them up emotionally. Men. So you really have to watch how you say things and, <clears throat> and your own tone, voice, and everything to make sure that, you know, even if the story, you're pretty well sure the person's just. Maybe making it up, which I have really never had a hoax come in. I did with a previous group I was with. I had a hoax that they all got mad at me because I said it was a hoax and then found out it was. Uh, the two high school kids filmed an object, which my first clue was the entire video was like the best HD you could ever imagine except the object. It was blurry. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> and one question I always ask myself is, what does this person have to gain from telling me their story? And if they've got anything they could gain from it, then you got to look at it with more of a fine tooth comb than you might initially. And that's what I've done with this particular instance. Come to find out the two boys were headed to High State University in the fall for video editing. That was going to be one of the things they were majoring in. So, of yeah. course testing out their skills with a group that's supposed to analyze videos. <laughs> uh, you pick up on things like that. I've always been pretty decent at reading people anyway. But it's it's a lot of fun. I've done cases though all over from Europe and all over the United States. So it's a lot of fun. So tell us some stories where you were not able to come up with a rational explanation and uh let you scratch in your head. Okay, that that's actually would be the most recent case that I had. Uh, from a couple months back, uh, a guy had got a hold of me through uh, my podcast, actually, uh, Paranormal Road. <clears throat> he was in uh, Louisiana, he, down off of uh, Lake Pontchartrain, big lake down there. And all around that lake, they have little restaurants and bars and whatnot, and they do volleyball tournaments at night. So... Uh, he was sitting out in front of his uh, condo, and from where the, vi the film was, the picture, 
to the right, you can see the bright stadium lights, almost a blue cast to them from the volleyball court. Well, up in the sky, pretty high up, there were two uh, uh, very bright blue objects, and he said they were at least six foot wide by his estimates. It was hard to tell from the photo. And they flew in a very erratic triangle pattern. They weren't triangle craft, but they were flying in the shape of a triangle. And it was very odd. You know, I got uh, pictures of things on my website that anybody wants to, they can go look at it. And I thought, you know, this is very strange. There is an Air Force base there uh, right outside of New Orleans. So I had got a hold of them and sent the, the uh, Air Force uh, public relations person I spoke with. He said, well, send me your what you've got, and we'll see what we can figure out. So I sent him the photos and the information, and I didn't hear anything for a couple weeks. So I sent a couple more emails, and he finally got back with me and says, yes, I had received all your information, and I am not helping you whatsoever. And that was it. So that was very strange to me. I mean, I expected more of a I don't know or we didn't find anything. You know, something along those lines. Not a straight out, I'm not going to help you. But I was, so the, the gentleman that saw the uh, objects, about two weeks, I believe, went by. And he calls me again. And uh, we're talking about that. And he's kind of like, takes a step back. And he's like, well, wait a minute, they're back. And as I was talking to him the second time, the objects were flying around him again. And he sent me more photos. And I have no idea. My very first thoughts were, because uh, I've seen pictures and videos of this before, uh, birds. Most like seagulls and birds that are predominantly white, sometimes they'll glow if a bright light's hit them, like from a city or stadium lights. News crews have ran into that before when they've done uh, different news stories, like Columbus, Ohio, and big cities. The birds will glow because they come in big flocks but in this particular case that wasn't it not when he was giving me more information than i initially had to go on i still think there's a chance that the craft or whatever they were were possibly illuminated by those really bright uh lights from the volleyball court i had spoke with the gentleman that had recently bought that business and he said that he had left early that night and then he had confirmed it with the volleyball people. When they left, they had forgot to turn the lights out. So the lights were on all night. So they were all gone by the time this object was seen. So haven't heard any more back from it since then. So I have no idea. I was completely stumped on that one. Hmm. So, so what is the... Um... What's the best one in Ohio that has stumped you? Or have you cracked all those cases? For Ohio, for the most part, I've been able to solve everything. The most interesting, I would probably say, is that experimental craft. If that's what it exactly was, I can't, like I say, 100% confirm it. Uh, even though I'm, you know, with the information I had to go with anyway... I'm pretty sure that's probably what it was. I did get an interesting one uh, that led me to some other information. This uh, sighting actually happened before I was even born. <laughs> but a lady got a hold of me. It was from 1973, if I'm not mistaken. I don't have my uh, site pulled up at the moment. But she was coming back from a little town, which is just south of us, about 18 miles south uh, east of Laurelville. It's a small little Amish type community. And we have our pumpkin show every uh, October. Big uh, yep. festival people grow, you know, 1,900 pound pumpkins, a big thing. And she was uh, with her church. They was in Laurelville. She was bringing a float up for one of the parades. That's how I was able to narrow down the dates because she had forgot. Well, she saw this uh, orange cigar shaped craft follow her all the way back to town and it was no higher than just right above the power lines. It traced the whole way. And when she got back to town, she got doing whatever she was doing, turned off on the 
whatever street she was going to and lost sight of it. She was freaked out and didn't want to say anything because, you know, people look at her like she's crazy. Well, I done a little digging into it and found out that that particular craft she saw that day, well, during that 24-hour period, that was the most active uh, day in Ohio history for UFO reports. Franklin County Sheriff's Office that night got 150 reports of that exact same craft. Charleston, West Virginia had over 100 uh, reports of the same craft, several places in Kentucky, all around, and that was the biggest uh, UFO wave in a single day in this region's uh, history that's ever been documented. So, so that had to have been investigated by people before then, right? Or, I mean... Uh, did come I didn't find any uh, explanation or anything that would substantiate that it was actually looked into other than just people taking reports but they said it was so busy in franklin county they had to call in several off-duty uh officers just to answer the phones they couldn't keep up with all the phone calls wow wow so you've never you've never come across anybody's other investigations even has a explanation for what they think it could have been huh no i haven't I, I didn't see where anybody had ever really even investigated it other than just taking reports and kind of just leaving it at that. Well, that's kind of crazy. If it, I'm sure I, somebody probably has. I just haven't ran across it as of yet because that would have definitely been a good one for uh, Project Blue Book. <laughs> if it was. I, yeah, I would think so. And I'm, well, very familiar with Project Blue Book. I've actually handled the actual government unedited documents numerous times. Really? A friend of mine uh, lives uh, right outside of uh, Dayton, right by Wright Patterson. He uh, was a UFO investigator doing the same thing that I am. He got out of it since through, for different reasons. But uh, several years back, he when he was still actively researching everything and doing investigations, he was bored one night, got on Craigslist, and typed in UFO. Just see what would come up. Well, a guy in his, not too far from him, it was in uh, Fairborn, Ohio, had said, uh, I've got some UFO documents. So he thought, well, you know, I'll go take a look and see what's what. Well, the guy had went to an auction, an estate sale, uh, at a house there in the area, and bought a whole stack of, a whole pile of lumber bunch of just wood and stuff and you got the whole pile clear to the ground well underneath that pile was a great big basket it was smashed but in that basket were all these documents <laughs> so my, buddy, my buddy bought it all 100 bucks bought it and brought it home and found started seeing a familiar uh, name on a lot of the documents well just a, a repeated name and he got online done some research he was able to track the guy down guy lives in, uh, I believe it's Alabama now, and found out he was the guy that wrote those documents and lived in the house where the estate sale took place. Well, when he moved, he just left everything. Project Blue Book was done. It was over with. You know, he cleaned out everything that needed to be cleaned out and just left it. The government didn't want anything to do with it anymore. There was no real smoking gun evidence in anything. So it was just kind of left so through their correspondence back and forth, the guy said, well, when I get back to Florida, whatever certain time of year, he said, uh, get a hold of me. I've got a lot more stuff I'll send you. And ended up sending him several more boxes of documents. So my friend ended up, uh, took a while, but he got it all done digitally. And they're all on uh, Black Vault uh, website. You can look at them there. But he had it all put into digital format. And then he sent all paper copies to uh, the University of New Mexico, they're, put, they're putting in a UFO wing in their library. Oh, my they would, God. They would have a lot better capability to archive it, you know, papers and stuff. So they wouldn't get destroyed. That, that's amazing. That, that really that really is. So because he was bored one night looking on Craigslist, he discovered all that paperwork. Exactly. And nothing was blacked out. Nothing was edited. I mean, it was just as it was originally written. Of wow. course, I 
I wasn't able to, of course, look through everything, but I mean, it was names and addresses, phone numbers. I mean, every little bit of information you could expect out of a a report, uh, conclusions of what was, you know, found. But like I say, no smoking gun evidence or anything that I'm aware of. But it was still interesting to to see it. Oh yeah, that's cool. unredacted reports. That would be very interesting to have. Well, wasn't it uh, Project Blue Book's whole? Um, mission to go and basically disprove any exactly anything. yeah so so of course there would be smoking a smoking gun um, I just well, wondered there, for... there are uh, of the 12,000 I believe it was blue book cases there's still 701 cases they never sold really you still, mean the, they never could even de- like come up with a made up story like nothing. Yeah, there was yeah. none that they could come up with that, you know, that would work. They were just too outlandish or just, I don't know. I don't know what all the exact reports are, but still quite a number of them, though, that they were not able to, to make up something about. Yeah, that's quite a few. It's quite a few. I, it's, a, it's surprising they just didn't rubber stamp them all weather balloons. <laughs> you know what I'm <laughs> well, when, they probably would have if they could have got the people to buy it. You have to come up with a story to get the public to calm down. Otherwise, you're going to have more of a fight on your hands than you might bargain for in that case. <laughs> so, um, so how... How busy do you keep uh, investigating UFO reports? It's very sporadic. But what I found is interesting, and I don't really think there's much of a correlation to it, but it seems like when I get a report, no matter where it's from, that I'll usually get anywhere from two to four within about a week or so, Within about a week. They don't, they're not related but it seems like there's always more than one. It's not one report, and then you'll go two or three months and get nothing. There's always a few kind of really close together. But then it could go two or three months, and you hear nothing. It's just very... November is the most active month, though, for as far as local stuff goes. I don't know why, but November is always a big one. A lot of uh, reports. And some interesting craft. I've read other local reports when I was with other groups that, you know, they didn't like the fact that I was able to actually figure stuff out and all that. But I had read some reports local of people seeing craft that were, you know, over an acre wide. Holy mo- What? You know, ma- and only 75 feet off the ground. You know, massive. More than once. And more, you know, people that did not know each other in different areas of the county. A very large craft. That's incredible. It's amazing how something like that could be only like 75 feet off of the ground and nobody notice it. Completely quiet. That's unreal. Too many people with their heads looking down at their phones and all that kind of stuff is, you know, be my thing. I mean, you can have... Anything can happen. I mean, I see it around here all the time. People see something like maybe a hot air balloon or something will fly over, and you'll see somebody that's out. No, did you see that? Well, no. Well, how could you miss it? Well, I was checking a text message or doing this or that. Well, do, you, do, you, do you see the irony in that, though? Is that the device that, that would be most readily available to... Uh, make the you know prove that there is something there through video or a picture is also the device that keeps you from uh noticing it in the first place you know that's that's the bane right there the 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 phone in your hand is what would help you prove to the world maybe that uh something extraterrestrial exists but it's uh too busy got your attention for other things (laughs) <laughs> that's pretty crazy maybe maybe that was the government's idea is to give us all cell phones so that we couldn't uh, 
couldn't document their uh, spaceships. There is something I've I've heard reports. I've never looked into it really at all. Just random stuff I've ran across. But it, it's interesting that they people have claimed that when there's been larger uh, sightings, you know, multiple people reporting the same thing, that there has been uh, people reporting that while the sighting was like in progress. Numerous people were getting uh, like random text messages, like spam, and uh, people were speculating that that was to get you to look at your phone and quit looking up. <laughs> I've never heard that one. That's interesting. I sure. mean, there could be something to it. I I really don't know. I've never really looked into it myself, but it's just something I've heard that. People are getting these random messages like an advertisement or, you know, whatever. Just all around the same time to, to divert their attention from whatever they were looking at. You know, it, it wouldn't surprise me. It's possible. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me at all. <laughs> well, I, I mean, is there any... Okay, so... Is there anything that lead you to believe that anything that you've seen in a report, got a phone call about, investigated is actually an extra something that's not of this earth? Nothing that I have got personally, no. Everything that I've got I'm very confident even if I can't exactly say 100% what it was everything's got an earthly you know explanation not every case of course i can always figure out majority i can but there's always going to be a couple here and there that you end up at dead end just like the louisiana deal and maybe the experimental craft from ross county things like that that you can't 100 percent confirm but nothing that i've received as of yet but i'm always hopeful though well, so so is there anything, so what cases that you personally, you know, you know all the famous cases, uh, the lights over, where is it, Denver, or, um, you, you know, even the Roswell crash, any of those uh, famous cases over the years, or even not so famous cases that you know about, do any of them, like, strike a chord with you, like, ah, you know, this may be something from outer space? This may be something I, I can't explain. Definitely. Well, Roswell, definitely. There's enough supporting evidence from the things I've looked into that I don't think that was anything that was from Earth. And another big one is the Phoenix Lights case back in the 90s. That yeah. was seen by so many people, and it was such a large craft. Even the governor that had made fun of it at the press conference. Yeah. And came out after he was out of office and said he wished he hadn't done it because that was, you know, even he believed it was an alien craft. He came back late, you know, years later and said, you know, I, yeah. I would have never done that. He felt so guilty. Yeah, that particular case always fascinated me. When I hear about the Phoenix Lights, uh, to this day, there nobody still has no idea what that was. Right. Yeah. One of my that, one of my favorite cases, though, and I coincidentally just saw it tonight on uh, Project Blue Book on the History Channel. They done uh, the Hopkinsville, uh, Kentucky case. It was uh, it was August twenty first, I believe it was nineteen fifty five, and it was a family down there, uh, just kind of a backwoods, you know, just average little family, uh, claimed anyway that a UFO had landed on their property. And they had a gunfight with the alien creatures for over three hours. Their cabin was riddled with bullets where they were inside the house, you know, shooting back toward out in the area, you know, their fields and in the woods and stuff, and claimed they actually shot one of them. And local law enforcement investigated it initially and said they never found any evidence of anything being there. But it was, was always there interesting. Was their, la was their last name the McCoys? <laughs> and this happened to be the Hatfields that no. showed up. <laughs> because I can't believe if you could fly an aircraft from another planet that you, 
you know, I think the judge had said that before. Their technology would have to be better than shooting back at you with the same kind of weapon that you got. Well, they never had any weapons. They were just there. And, oh, so the, so they had yeah, a gunfight. They had a gunfight, but the but the aliens weren't returning fire. Correct. They were trying oh. to get into the house, though. Holy smoke! Yeah, they were very short, uh, like three foot tall. Uh, it was just a very crazy, you know, story. But it was closed so quick that it really was never looked into all that much and there was always a lot of speculation surrounding what the people may have actually saw or whatever but it was over three hours though that they said and they found you know plenty of evidence that proved that the family was definitely doing some high volume, doing some high volume fire yeah <laughs> they're shooting at, shooting at somebody yeah okay all right all right well so so I mean, how? So you're you're pretty dedicated to this. I mean, I've seen your your Facebook page. I've seen your uh, website. I mean, the, so this is something you're very passionate about. I mean, do you is this something you think you're going to continue doing for at, forever, or is this something that you, um, you know, you just you're going to move on to something else? I mean, what? Uh, what I'm definitely going to stick with it. You know, I've got no reason to to not stick with it as far as that goes and it's took long enough to build up a reputation and trying to get my name out there and stuff I wouldn't want to you know have all that be a wasted effort so I advertise yeah. like as much as I can around town and always have business cards I leave everywhere and things of that so, sort. so I, I put a lot of my own resources into it so, so for all of our listeners out there, if they were going to contact you with a uh, case, you know, with a sighting that they wanted you to check out, uh, what, like what kind of advice, like what would you tell somebody um, if you see something that is strange, if you see something that's unusual, like what should they make mental or even write down notes on? make mental notes or, you know, physical notes on what they're seeing before they get a hold of, you know, before they get a hold of it, you know, if, right. if you're in, because if, if you're in the middle of seeing something fantastic or unbelievable, sometimes you don't think of whipping out your phone or, uh, really, um, taking on down all the details, but, I mean, there's got to be some kind of process that might help you out more before somebody reports to you to kind of help your investigation. Oh, definitely. Uh, there's several things that always help, but main is uh, location. The time is always really crucial because when I check a lot of the flight radars and other astronomical, you know, things that could be going on, timing is key the closer you can get to the actual time the better and one thing that a lot of people have trouble with but i can uh i try to help them with is size of the object and when i say size i don't necessarily mean you know that it's 50 foot wide or whatever because that stuff's hard to judge mm -hmm. so i usually yeah. say you know if you were to hold your arm out straight out up the object if you know would a penny cover the object would it take something like a golf ball to cover the object? How large, you know, something in your hand would it take to cover the object you saw? And then from that, I can kind of estimate uh, okay. how big it actually is. Height, if there's anything in the area where you saw it, uh, is always helpful. Like, if there's a large tree around, you know, how high do you think it was above that tree or... You know, how many of those trees stacked on top of each other would it take to reach your object? That kind of thing. Or cell phone towers. So height is always, you know, a prominent thing. Because other than that and noise, if there's any sound to it, most stuff people tend to remember pretty easy. Stuff Details, believe it or not, tend to stick with people more than some might realize. 
uh, direction of travel. That's why on my uh, website, I've got a form that, that actually lists all these different things and people can fill it in. Ah, okay. But, I, mm-hmm. but my form is set up in such a way, though, that all the information of like your sighting is in one part and all your personal information is in another part. So it's all separate. Because when I put it on my website, all I do is a copy and paste of what you wrote, but I never put any personal information on the website. So I do read the full report and everything, obviously. Mm -hmm. But if there is anything personal in there, I will take that out. But I try to have everything set up in a way that your names and things of that sort doesn't need to be in the main body of your story. That's in a separate section. Well, I I think that would probably... um that probably goes a long way to encouraging people to report what, you know, if they're seeing something yes. because, because the more, I mean, of course you don't want somebody that misidentifies a life flight in the field every right. other week. <laughs> okay. But if you do get, you know, if you do get some interesting reports, you want to be able to put them out there for other people to see right. and, and, some people, uh, well, a lot of people, let's just face it, are gonna are gonna not gonna report something if they for fear that their right. name's gonna be put out there. As you, matter, yeah, you brought up a good point too. Is the reason a lot of people will tend to report the same things over and over, like you said, life flight or whatever, is because they're not getting a good enough explanation to begin with to get them to understand what they're seeing. Right. I give them a good enough explanation, whether it be video, and I've got another program I use, it's called Stellarium, and I can set up the night sky for anywhere in the world at any date I choose, in the past, in the future, or whatever, and it will show me everything in the sky, what satellites are flying around, what stars twinkle, meteors, if they're going to be coming by, all of that, and I use tools like that to prove it to people. And next time they see something, that sticks in their mind that, wait a minute, this is just like what I saw before. Uh And they don't report. And on my uh, YouTube channel that I have, which I don't upload on there a whole lot, but I've made videos in the past that actually train people how to be a good witness. And the way you can do that, and I show all the different tools that I use, flight radars and whatnot. Flight radar is a big one. And some of the weather uh, websites that I use tell about cloud cover and all of that. And I'll tell people, you know, go outside. You know, you can do it day or night. It doesn't really matter. Uh, nighttime's a little more challenging, but it's a better way to practice. Find an airplane flying over. You know, doesn't matter. And then on a piece of paper, write down everything you think about that plane, how high is it, what direction it's going, all that kind of stuff. How big is it? And then when you get in and go to the links that I provide, you can actually check your answers. You can see the plane on, on your computer screen. And it will tell you on the side how high it is, what kind of an airplane it is, how big it is, where it's going, where it came from. And then you can look at your notes and see what you got right, what you got wrong. And you do that a number of times, you get fairly decent at figuring this stuff out. And then if you ever do see something, you're more apt to give more accurate information. Do you, you do know you're des- you're describing a, a app that we could all create that would just be the greatest game ever played? Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you're, uh, we need to get this in development like, right now. <laughs> Because I, I got to tell you, I couldn't like. That's one thing I would never be able to judge is the size of, especially at night, the size yeah. of something and the distance. It's very uh, hard. Yeah, I, I can't even really do it. I mean, it's there's very few people that could actually do it, unless you're maybe a flight control, you know, air traffic controller type of person, or somebody military wise that deals a lot in takeoffs and landings and things but for the most part it's almost impossible that's why i rely on flight radars and things of that sort 
to be able to let me know for sure because I can actually watch it right on the screen. Right, right. Well, well, I'm going to tell you this much, William. <clears throat> if you call me up next week and say, um, "Listen, I- I've got proof. I've just I've, I've done all this research, and there's a U- I, you know a UFO landed, and three aliens came out and were you know bought gas at the uh, UDF there at the corner in Circleville." I would absolutely believe it because nothing about anything that you're that you sat here and told us leads me to believe that you're anything but thorough and uh you know double triple check in your work and uh i mean it's just you're earnest about trying to find the truth you know is there's nothing fantastic you know and then that's not in a disparaging way there's nothing fantastic about what you're trying to tell us you know it's not like you're uh sugarcoating anything it's like hey these are the facts and I'm not, sorry i'm not trying to present something that's not there i mean if it's no. there i'll present it regardless of if it is a an no. actual alien thing or if it's just an airplane or whatever it might be i mean i just want to give an answer i'm not trying to really prove or disprove anything it's just, just trying, to- trying to figure out what the person saw right so i have I had a case out of Michigan uh, last year that would ended up being some skydivers at nighttime. That was kind of neat. <laughs> Jesus. They, well, because at night they'll put uh, flares on their ankles and they light up. So all you're seeing through the sky is just the the fire. Mm-hmm. Can't I've see seen it. that before. That it looks weird. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. This was right over Detroit. Oh, okay. Oh, jeez. Why would you? They were landing at a. Uh, well, there was a skydiving school there that I had found and found out that the skydivers were landing at a Catholic college up there right on the football field. Well, I, I'm just going to say from having lived up there, there's some places in Detroit you don't want to skydive into at night. <laughs> so, <laughs> or, day, or daytime. That well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at least daytime you might have a, might have a chance. <laughs> but so, so, okay, William, before we... Um, in the interview, the, I, there is two stories that you told me that that I told these guys that will be the two of the best stories they've ever heard, and they have nothing to do with UFOs. So, if you are would be so inclined, um, share with share with our audience and Jason because the judge got cut off. Um, these uh, these two stories <laughs> that you told me, because I'm hoping that I, the people that I know that listen to this podcast when it comes out on Friday mornings in the middle of the night while they're driving will uh, will maybe have to pull their car over and uh, reevaluate their lives a little bit. Yes. So, <laughs> so 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 William, if you will tell tell these uh, those couple of stories that you related to me. Uh, I would be very uh, appreciative. Sure. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we're out of time today. So tune in next week where our very special guest, William Haddix from the Central Ohio UFO Reporting Center, will continue this interview and tell us about his own personal paranormal experiences. I'm sure you're looking forward to that as much as we are. Please visit us on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash from the shadows podcast and on our Instagram page at instagram.com forward slash from the shadows podcast. You can visit our web page at from the shadows podcast dot go daddy sites dot com or Contribute to our Facebook discussion page called After the Shadows. And tweet us on our Twitter feed at twitter.com forward slash podcast underscore from. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you all. Until next time, never shy away from the darkness 
or what may be lurking in the shadows. We are out. Ha 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 ha.